So Fabrice uh, was, uh, he has a Basque name I discovered. Uh, you know what the Basque? Never mind. Uh, <laughs> he grew up in a, a place that, uh, that some of you should know, the only foothold of France in Canada, Saint Pierre Miquelon. Ha! Ah. And he has worked on fish in the last 15 years. He worked on fish taxonomy, but first in, uh, uh, on the Gadi Day in Lyon and Paris, and that's why he knows uh, uh, Nicolas. And uh, then he has worked from the University of Nancy, which uh, is in Eastern France, where my mother also come from. Uh, uh, he was based on the University of Nancy and worked on aquaculture. Um, and he has developed a competitive framework for the productive strategies of freshwater in fish species. Now, the, the thing is, he will present to us a vision of uh, aquaculture that uh, provide, promised, to, promised to be challenging, uh, at least in a discussion I had with him, it was already the case. So, uh, Abris, your, your, your turn. <laughs> so, here we go. First of all, I would like to, to thank uh, UBC, Peter Wall Institute, as well as the French Embassy for funding my journey here. First uh, in Victoria for one week, and this week uh, in UBC. Uh, not only I'm really happy to be in front of you this morning, but um, I'm kind of proud because I, I met Professor Pauli 20 years ago, and we have a discussion with, and Nicola was there also. I don't know if you remember, but I remember it uh, if it was yesterday, you know. And we talked for hours. And I think in your life, in your career, you will meet people, and few of them will have a significant uh, impact on your journey afterwards. So thank you very much. Um, with a big move, you will in my voice, but then it's going uh, going better. So my talk uh, this morning is a mix of what I'm doing in teaching in research, and I must confess my obsession about fish, fisheries, aquaculture, and everything related to fish. <laughs> so basically, before starting on uh, our favorite animals, I will just give you some uh, few slides about what happened to us on land before starting to speak about what we are doing right now on the, with marine uh, animals. So basically, modern humans emerged around 200,000 years ago. And from that moment, as any animals on Earth, we rely on the wild animals and plants. I will only focus on animals this morning. And so we were all hunters and uh, gatherers. But 12,000 years ago, there was a key event in the history of human of humanity, which uh, was a process which is called domestication. And domestication for this talk will be really uh, uh, simply defined by the process by which animals will become adapted generation after generation to two things. The rearing system that you will provide as well as human. So this uh, process that occurred in very few areas in the world. They are called homelands, and they're in orange or red here. And that's where the, the crops and the animals were available. You see, there were very few animals that were humans were able to domesticate at that time. And from those points, the farmers <coughs> take their animals and the plants with them and colonize the entire world. So there's a lot of consequences of that. The first consequences is that we remain about one million for a long period of time, but then we increase significantly. And you know that in the past centuries, as you can see on this graph, the number of humans has increased a lot. Not only our number have increased a lot, but we were also able to go everywhere in the world. And not only we were able to go everywhere, we were able also to change the entire world. 
and we build good city. This is only because we were able to feed ourselves and not relying on nature any longer. When you're able to feed some people, they're the farmers, then other people can do other stuff. And this is exactly what happened. And you can see from 1960 up to today, we are producing much more. And this is in billion tons. So we are producing a lot of food globally. But when you look at, not only at the volumes, but you look at the, actually what we do produce, this rely on tiny, tiny uh, species. And those species, so agriculture all around the world, is based on these very few species, plants, and animals that our ancestors domesticated and spread all around the world. So agriculture today is based mostly on introduced, or what we call now alien species. Domesticated plant is only 0.08% of all the wild plants that we know today. Domesticated animals, of course most of them are insects, but it's only 0.002%. Those four crops, wheat, rice, um, potatoes, rep represent all together more than any of the other crops in the world in terms of volumes. When you look at animals, those big five, the, not the big five, those species <laughs> are called the big five, sorry. And those represent nearly 90% uh, of the, live, the livestock of big animals that there are. You can see the onset of domestication for cow, sheep, pig, goat, and horse. This is basically what we use to feed ourselves throughout the world. And you can see, we are producing a lot of them. For pig, sheep, and cow, it's close to one billion or more. And not only we were we able to produce a lot of them, but we were able to change them to specific goals. Of course, it takes a lot of time, but we were able, we think, if out of these domesticated animals, producing breeds, and breeds could be understood as a group of animals that share specific traits, for meat, for milk, whatever you want. We're not always aware of that, because what we do eat is not directly the animals, it's of course products. And when you eat meat, you can eat different kind of, different kind of meat. But never forget that these come from the same animal species that were domesticated a long time ago. Not only we are producing meat from those animals, but we are also consuming milk and yogurt. And as a French, I must say that we also produce a lot of very good cheese. <laughs> But never forget that this comes from only one wild species that was domesticated in the past millennium. So this is the main consequences. Human increase a lot. We go everywhere. We change a lot of things. But our uh, number of species that we do eat decrease significantly during this period of time. And there's another trend today is not only the species that we do it, but also the way we're eating them are little by little being the same. And as you can see on this graph, uh, not on this graph, on this map, sorry, uh, there's two leading, I just put this to an example, but if you're going to Paris or here, you can eat exactly the same way if you want. <laughs> and sometimes I go in very different countries, and I can see those two almost everywhere. So the consequences are for the human. The other ones are for the animals. If you go there, you're in France, for example, you're in a city, you just go 10 or 20 kilometers from the sea. This is what you see. You will think this is natural. Natural landscape and animal. Because we're used to see that for a very long period of time. There's nothing natural like it uh, for those species. Those species have been modified a lot from their wild candidate. But we're just used to that, and our parents, grandparents, and so on, are used to that. And this 
animals represent 60-70% of all the wild, of all the animals, sorry, that you may have in, a, in certain regions. So there's apparently a clear dichotomy between what we call the very few domesticated species and that were strongly modified and all the other that we will call wild fauna. And I have kids and I always explain that this is farm, domestic animal, and this is wild fauna. So we are, from our, our childhood, used to make a distinction between those two. So consequences for us, consequences for the animals that we modify, and of course consequences for the earth. So domestication is not only a significant step in the history of humanity, but also for the entire biosphere. And as you can see, we used to be there, and depending on where you are on Earth, you could be on the, so I'm left-handed, so I'm never uh, on the other side, okay? Um, so, for example, in Europe, you will be, if you see the landscape, you don't have that many uh, areas that are, could be called natural. Most of the, if you fly through uh, France or other countries, the only thing that you will see is mostly intensive agriculture and cities. Everything has been modified, but this has been modified a long time ago, so we, we get used to it. And sometimes we have the feeling that things are going better because there's something in blue. And we're saying, oh, there's natural parts. They're not natural, that have been destroyed and reconstructed. So actually we're doing something else. So there's nothing pristine, for example, in France, or very tiny amount of areas. I'm saying in French because I'm French, but I would say in almost all the countries, it's, you can have this, this kind of evolution. Of course, we have much more now. We have pollution. We have biotic homogenization, which means that we, because we move species all around the world, the fauna tend, and also the, the plants tend to be the same everywhere. And more recently, the climate change. The changes are so big that uh, scientists coined a new uh, term, which is the Anthropocene, to say that for now 150 years, we have entered a new geological epoch in terms that what is the driving force of biosphere that scientists were studying two or three centuries will be the impact of humans on the entire Earth. Of course, we're developing everywhere, we're just trying, we're modifying what's happening for the fauna, the wild fauna, and, and the plants. They're disappearing, of course, we take their place, so they're going to disappear. And this is exactly what's happening on land. Uh, Hamiltonists usually recognize five main extensions, and these are defined as a period of about two million years, where three quarters of what is known disappeared. And those were, we could say natural, at least they were not depending on men. But what we are observing today is a rate that is 1,000 higher than the normal extent rate. That's what people have coined that we are living the sixth extension. So clearly on land, we have a lot of examples that men has uh, made disappear a lot of species. And what we are trying, we are trying to save some of them. I put this one, this is the finite, I love it, I don't know why. So we're going to save some of them. Why are we saving those and not the other ones? Because we only like them. I don't see any other reason. So I, I make an article just to, for saying that, are we making zoo as Noah's heart? So we're picking about, in zoo there's actually 8,000 animals, wild well, animals. And for those lions and rhinoceros and so on, the, those animals, they are more in zoo than in the wild nature. But never forget, and that's what I said in this article, those, uh, for example, fauna. Uh, there's huge things about fauna in, in France, and there was the Chinese that came and said, it's wonderful. Yeah, it's wonderful because we have a reproduction. But what we're doing with this, is that they're entering the process of domestication. So, 
they're going to be the babies, the babies of the babies, and so on. So probably 100 years, I don't know, but we're going to modify that much, this animal, that it will no, not be able to go back in the well. And this is really important, because zoo will say, okay, we keep them, because we're going to put them back in nature. Actually, it's pretty rare. Why? Because we're destroying nature. So we should better stop that and try to solve as much as possible the nature that, that we still have. The story is really different, but actually we can say that's the same process. Fishing is actually the same thing as hunting. You go on the sea and you will kill animals at what point of their life. So it's capturing wild aquatic animals in nature. And it works pretty well. And back to the 1960, uh, 1950, you see the trend up to uh, before, up to sorry, 1990, was that we could put a lot of boats. We still have the capture is increasing, so there's a lot of food uh, in the sea. Let's go capture. But actually, what this global trend was masking is that. There were not a lot of stocks, and of course, I must say about the Atlantic cod in the coast of Canada. This global was actually masking that numerous stocks were collapsing. And I leave, like uh, Professor Pauline said, I was born in Saint Pierre, Michelin. So I think that everything starts from that point. Uh, so my name is Tivichie, and it's Basque, so it's this one. The other one is Brittany and Normandy. So this is the three main, um, three main sources, I want to say, from uh, the people living in San They all come for only one reason, in God we trust. There was only one reason, and if you live there, and there's nothing else to do, you leave. So they were... There were poor people living in Europe going there because they can live, they can have, uh, survive, not live. At that time, it was survive. So, my grandfather used to do that. My uncles used to do that. And probably, if the uh, fishery has not collapsed, I will not be in front of you, but I will be a fisherman, which I'm not. So, in card we trust, in card we trust, and, I and there was a really good talk that you have. And I saw it uh, this morning, and that was one of the best uh, presentation on this uh, that I saw uh, on the, the collapse of the Nordic Coast. So I will not go back. But just to say that for Saint Pierre Miquelon, it's tiny, nobody hears, except that I was born there. So <laughs> I was uh, about 15 uh, years old when it collapsed. So I was uh, not too young, you know, to remember pretty well what happened. And 50% of the private sector, which means all the islands actually, live from this only one uh, industry. And like this, it stopped. So I will make another presentation on San Pierre if you want to next week. <laughs> and I can talk hours in that, and I will probably do. <laughs> but anyway, let's go back to the global. Just to say that I'm not only writing or reading stuff. I leave it from you know, the inside. So I think this will change my mind forever. Um, so when I left Sam here, for me, oh, that's stupid, but all the sea was empty. You know? Because I cannot understand, because we take all the fish, so probably there's no longer fish in the sea. But that was, of course, I was wrong. But then I understand what happened. We fish other things. Actually, we don't really care when this collapse. It's collapsing, we go somewhere else. So we start fishing smaller fish. We start to fish at deeper waters. And you can see in the blue the trend. So deep sea fishing is like mining. You go, you take it away, and it will never come back. And we start fishing offshore. We build bigger boats. That's how we were able to fish more. It's to go everywhere. But at one point, 
the Earth is finite. You know, when you go everywhere at each step and you fish all the stuff, you arrive at what they call a plateau. But of course, we are at UBC and there's a lot of work that has been done. And we know that our fisheries are in crisis. And we know that the trend is even worse if you take into account all the stuff. And when I'm going to present uh, what we're doing with Professor Pauli on saint pierre you know, it's really important to take into account all the stuff to understand what is really happening in, in reality. So why the world fisheries in, is in crisis? Because we know there's too many boats and we're still not fishing more. And we know that if you look at not only at the global, but also the stocks, we know that some of them have collapsed, so it's too late. And one third are close to collapse because they are about exploited. And we know there's also many impacts of fisheries. The guy here is me. I wanted to be a fisherman at least for two weeks. That was the most difficult thing I've done in my life. <laughs> Except being in front of you, of course. <laughs> but I went there for two weeks and I said, oh, I'm a grandson of a fisherman. Don't worry. We just left from Concarneau and about 10 minutes I just throw away four <laughs> I was sick like a dog. And then I understand this is the most difficult, even today, fisherman is the most difficult work in the world. So you have to understand that if you want to make the change, because it's really difficult. And what I understand is when you look at FAO or whatever, your work you're doing also AC, here, sorry, it's this year. Oh, you say two tons, ten tons, it's nothing. These the fish were just put on the deck, and my job was just to throw them away. And this is a waste. And if you don't go at least once in a boat, you don't really understand what is bycatch and so, so on. So there's a lot of impacts on dolphins, on whatever turtles, on, and also on, on the, if you have trawlers, you know that you will have impacts on, on the fauna as well on the benthic uh, ecosystems. And we know now that besides that, we have climate change. So a lot of work are, doing, are done here also on those. This is not instead of, it's plus. So do we know what we have to do? Of course, yes. Of course, yes, we know. But this is really hard. I consider myself a biologist. But when I go back to Saint Pierre and I talk to the fishermen at a very tiny scale, okay, global <coughs> scale, but I might be not, no longer a biologist. Because we know, we know now, we have enough data to, for saying that it, everything's going to collapse if we, we continue that. So I read this book and they say it's a balloon effect. I'm not sure that's they coin the term, but anyway, I understand it pretty well. So this is, um, you know, the fishing effort, just increasing. And what we do is that, okay, in Europe we say, okay, we decrease. Actually, we're not decreasing. It's just moving the boat somewhere else. So what we have to do is to decrease the balloon. And this is where it's really hard. Because when you're saying that, actually you're saying to people, you're going to lose your job. Because there's too many people, and there's only two solutions. I really don't do anything, and it's like what we live in Saint Pierre and all uh, uh, Newfoundland. People are going to leave their, lose their job. There's no fish. Or you try with fishermen and all the people involved in fishery try to decrease and make them understanding that uh, we have to. That's why I'm, I'm telling to to the pe to to the previous generation. I said you take everything. And for me, I have no, nothing else to do, so I have to leave to live in France, of course, because there are no longer jobs here. You know? That's the consequences. I have no choice. You have the choice not to do that. And I can tell you a lot of stuff. But <laughs> I know myself, so I can. So we know, first, there will no be, there will no solution if we're not decreasing over fishing and over capitalization. Okay, slide. Things from Sam here again. I went 
That was crazy. They take so many fish, they, they cannot even handle the fish. When you're saying that today, it's like So overcapitalization, it means that my uncle, he has a small boat. He's a small scale fisher. We call that petit fish in Saint -Pierre. He lived all his life on that. And he was competing against the huge trawler that I showed. Of course he lost. But this fishery, is, he lived for 50 years. And he has quite a lot of money because he has no kids. Anyway. <laughs> but, but the big industry, or the industry, only lasts actually one or two decades. So we know what we, we have to do. Stop overfishing, decrease overcapitalization. Over we have to adapt what nature can give to the number of boats. It's impossible in the, in the other way. It's impossible. So subsidies, there's a lot of work doing here in uh, UBC. So we have to promote the good ones and decrease and stop pro, uh, little by little or in, in a regular way the bad or the ugly one. And fight as much as possible about illegal, unreported, and unregulated uh, capture. We used to think that Mar uh, the sea was open to everybody. So the first one arrived, the first one is served. So this led to, uh, to people going anywhere. So we have to to change, and of course people are changing in different countries in the world. But we have to think that it's no longer open to everybody. But it's really hard when you're close to the fishermen saying that. You have to make like a privatization of resources. Being either on a national scale, like economic uh, exclusive zone, or individual transfer of quotas, or uh, tariffs, um, Journey. Yeah, you know what it means here. Thanks. <laughs> I'm not saying that those solutions are the best everywhere, but I think there are some solutions. And of course, now that we can go anywhere, we have to make some rules. And one of the best rules would be to protect some part of the ocean, and probably uh, the global ocean or uh, the more offshore to be uh, preserved. So that's what happened in the past decades. So I know that you have a lot of courses. There are people that are working on that, so this is not my work. This is the work that you're doing. So uh, I know that you, you know this perfectly. But if we do want to continue eating fish, and there's two reasons. In developed country, you see on commercial, eat fish. It's good for your health, for your heart, for whatever. And in developing countries, they don't have the choice most of the time. In developed countries, we do have the choice. So if we do want to continue eating fish, what are we going to do? We're going to do what we've done 10,000 years ago on land. That's it. So we are starting to farm fish. And I have some colleagues that are a little bit older than me. And when we started the career, aquaculture was nothing. They have no money to go to Congress, no money to work. And now they're leaving, they're, they're getting retired, and they have a lot of money to work. So that's bad for them. Anyway, so in 1980, aquaculture represents less than 6% of what's coming from fishing. So that was nothing, that was. But if you see the trend, it's increasing, it's decreasing a lot. And the animal growth is almost some years, about 12, 30 percent, which is very a lot. And according to the it's expecting to continue to grow. So I love this picture. Why? Because if I'm doing that for land, this is not years that I would have to put. This is millennia, probably. So we are living in two or three decades what has happened on land on very long period of time. So for the first time in human history, nearly half of what we do eat of the fish come from farming. 
So it's tremendous changes. And of course, I will give you some consequences of that and what we can do. But the first thing that we have to remind is that what we have done on land for millennia, we are doing quite the same thing in the case. So it's crazy when you think about it. So my main research is, can we consider that fisheries, actually we have our reports like that, fishery and aquaculture, production of each of them. So can we consider, as we will do for agriculture and hunting, that the two are separated uh, sectors, so black and white. And especially as biology, that's why I'm interested. Can we consider that fishery only target wild animals and aquaculture only farm domesticated animals? I remind you that domesticated is a tricky word because everybody in this room has something behind it. And that was the starting point about 10 years ago, just to try to understand what really means domesticated and can we use it to compare and what to compare. So when you look at, actually it's not dichotomy, when you like fisheries and aquaculture, just transition from some say true fisheries and true aquaculture. I don't really understand that, but there's a lot of different way of catching and producing fish in the world. And I, like I said, as a biologist, what I'm interested in is that when you look at, not at the fish, but on land, because on land there's hundreds of papers of people working on land domestication, of the animal domestication. Why? Because we have lots of, uh, the production is huge, and uh, the history is very long. So when you look at People will say, why don't we domesticate? Yeah, we use that, but actually, it's not like a right. It's not false or right. It represents the extreme of a process, not a simple economy. So my job was to try to say, well, to try to find how can we put names on the gray part. So to make a very long story short, I say, rather than trying to put to use only two boxes. Why not having different boxes? Very simple, but most often the most simple ideas are the hardest to find. And so rather than trying to speak about domesticated fish, or not, we try to propose something else, level of domestication. So it's based on two things. It depends from the wild to come. Do the farming need import from wine supply or not. So, almost the same thing, the control over the entire cycle. Do we master this control, this life cycle in captivity or not? And as the process of domestication as a start, but by definition as no hand, we are still continuing to improving domesticate animal, pork, chicken, so on, every day. So it's the same for the fish. Even though you started five years ago, they will be no hand. Close the life cycle of the fish and continue increasing whatever you think of. So technical, it means that only 20% will survive. So there is going to be 30, 40, 100. Uh, genetic improvement. I need two years to produce my fish. I will need one year and a half, one year, and so on, six months. That's what we've done. We blend on So basically, it's really simple. The legal zero is capture fisheries. You will go at one point in the life of a fish, you will kill it. That's it. The entire rest of his life, he lives on, on his own. So you're not controlling anything. The level one, and it's really important when I go to agriculture congress, for saying that. Because most of the people will make synonym between domestication and selection. Selection, as you can see after, is the end of the process. But as soon as you take animals from the wild, you put them in a rearing system, you're starting something new. There's different cases. Either they all want to die, and we're working a lot with wild fish. We want to make an experiment. You take 200 fish, you put them in the tanks, and two or three days after, you have to preach the students and say, they're all dead, what am I going to do? 
okay, we're going to try to find other, other subject. So, this is really important to understand. So, you are able to, some of them survive. Okay, so you continue the process. You say, okay, I have breeders, so big fish. Let's go, guys, you have to breed products. They don't want. Okay, can take one year, two years, hundred of years. Eel is the best example. There's so many money put on that, and you all know the life cycle of eel come from Europe, or, or here, you know, those other side. So, so in Europe, it leaves from, from France, for example, and go in the Saga Sea and come back. So to do that in captivity is just crazy. So there's a lot of money putting on that. Injection and so on is crazy. So depending on the species, it will work pretty well or not. So sometimes you have the larvae, and at the beginning of uh, Marie culture, that was the biggest problem. The larvae are very small. If you take salmon, the larvae are, are very big, so they can eat uh, pellets quite easily. But marine fish are so small, you have to invent food to give them. So that takes a lot of time, and for those reasons, I have colleagues that spend years and years trying to close the life cycle. Okay, you're good now. You have closed the life cycle. But you still, and especially at the beginning of the process, you still want to put some wild hooks. Why? Because never forget that, for example, I want to domesticate the Atlantic cod. Atlantic cod is present in all Atlantic Ocean. Of course, I will not take all the animals to put them in tanks. So I will pick only a few of them. So there's huge genetic bottleneck at the beginning of every domestication event. So if you want this genetic bottleneck not to be too strong, you will put for some years some new wild and goods. And at one point, you will decide, OK, now I make a clear separation between the wild and the domesticated animals. And only at that point, you have a clear separation between so the level 4 is the same as the level 3, except that they no more, no longer exchange between them. And the level 5 is that you're doing selective breeding. You have several tanks, hundreds, thousands of fish, and you're going to say, you're not going to produce. No, no, yes. You and you. And that's it. And then you will make the next generation, and basically what we started on growth. So we said, the fish that grow faster. We are changing quite a lot now. We are also working on more efficient. You give one kilogram of food, how much do you have of kilograms of animals? Which, when you think of sustainability, it's much better. So then I look at the literature and look at all what was known from the fish. And this is, exact, this is what I found for the 250 species that were listed in the FL. So you have, I would say, a better picture of actually what is done and the controlling of, of fish that we have. So the message was 7 out of 10 farm fish actually rely on wild input. What does it mean? If I close the fishery, there's no longer farming of those species. That's it. And because we are at the beginning of the process at the global scale, reach, oh, sorry, reaching any, this is really important because I have colleagues that say, okay, uh, I reached the level four, so no. Reaching any of this level does not imply that the entire production is based on that. If I take the sea bass, for example, you might have sea bass uh, in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, you might have the six of them from the supermarket, okay? The thing is that as farming will progress, the most of the volume will reach the highest uh, level. So it is estimated today that only about 15% of the global aquaculture is based on level five, or in other words, that we are selected the farm fish that we are producing. And if you do compare with what happened on land, today we still don't have really exploit the interest diversity within species. 
So there's a lot of things that remain to be done. So just to show you, if you look at, you go to the supermarket, this is what the lava you could find. So I'm trying to move, looking to have some colleagues working on it. Europe put so much money on that, they're using helicopters, it's crazy. Because this fish, Japanese love it, and they are ready to pay a lot, uh, very expensive. But it's only a level two. We're working on those for nearly 20 years now. And it's really hard because those big guys don't want to reproduce, to reproduce in tanks. And you have difference. So Atlantic Cod, that would be really interesting. We know how to uh, produce them. It's under level five. But it's not increasing, it's even decreasing. And probably we'll never farm Atlantic Cod at huge scale. Why? Because we still have so much wild stocks close to Norway in the Barents. So it's always not easier, but less expensive to go on the sea if you have a lot of boats, a lot of fish, sorry, than uh, try to farm them. If not, no, Norwegian thought that Atlantic cod would follow the same thing as Atlantic uh, salmon, but no, because of the fishery. And if you look, Atlantic salmon, sea bass, and gillhead sea green, this is the three main leading species in Europe. And all of them have reached level 5. In other words, we have uh, modified them in such a way that it's better growth, better fillet quality. So from that, I would ask a few questions. Might be a silly question, but actually I think it's really important, especially the global change that we all live in. Should we slow down fish domestication? When I asked my, this question to myself, I was not sure I will find a lot of information on land animals saying, okay, we went too far, uh, they're all uh, you know, uh, decreasing uh, because the bottleneck, genetic bottleneck was too strong. Truly, it's not the case. When I do speak with archaeozoologists, they say, no. Paris, what happened actually is that one, two, three, the level one, two, three for land animals, it occurs during millennia, which is you take animals, it's, they start changing them, but they were still, you know, crossing with our animals. And I do not go in, in deeper, but trust me, I make some courses on that. It uh, lasts very long period of time. The result of that is that when you look at the genetics of land animals, you have huge diversity, still huge diversity, except for very few breeds, like the primrose sign. The cattle, the dairy cattle, because there, yeah, in the past decades, we only using uh, about 60 males to produce all around the world. What's crazy? What's this doing? What's the doctor? Anyway, except that we have no. So you have huge diversity, which means that with the global change, we still have those in those animals probably the potential to adapt in different regions. When you look at one of the outlier, which is the Atlantic salmon and there's so many papers on that. It took only a few decades. Actually, it's not very long. Very old, sorry. It started in the early 70s, domestication or farming of Atlantic salmon, which is nothing. And they reached the level five in a few years, and we're already at a 12th generation of domestication. So when you do eat Atlantic salmon, you eat the babies of the babies of the babies, I guess. But they're starting to have some problems with Atlantic salmon. Why? Because most of them are producing cages. When you put them in cages, you're close to nature. And nature is changing. So if you select me for growth, you do not select me for global change. So now they try to adapt their selective program to take that into account. And it's really important to understand that. So yes, we have to improve our animals. But what means improving? Especially with climate change, ocean acidification, and pollution. What does it mean to improve? And for the land, the main thing now is not to produce more, it's to make animals more resistant to disease, to lack of water, to uh, heat, waves, 
for example, in Nancy now it's, it's close to 40. So your animals must be able to cope. Okay. Now that you have a lot of fish, farm fish that are in the process of domestication, what can happen? You put them into cages. You have a store. I remind you, most of the Atlantic salmon is produced in no. So you can have rough times. So those animals that have been modified can go back. And again, in land animals, there's a lot of stories. For example, cats eat the worst feral animal that you have. But for those animals, Atlantic salmon, they can go back. But for most of them, they're not that different from the wild kangaroos. So what are they going to do? They're going to mix. They're going to hybridize. So you will put in nature something that's supposed not to be in nature. So they're going to mix. And there's a problem of fitness. Is it a big problem? I would say it's a huge problem. And we don't know it. We only know from the Atlantic salmon. So everybody's saying Atlantic salmon is the worst thing because that's where the propagation are. It do doesn't mean that the problem is not known somewhere else. It's not studied. That's the reason. That's the reason. So here you see the report. Uh, I talked with Norwegian colleagues, and now it's such a huge industry. So. But they would say that before that, they, were not, they could not talk about that. Because now we have, you know, the trend is decreasing. So they're going to say we have made so significant progress. So now they like to, to talk about it. But when you look at one or two decades ago, there were millions of salmon going in the rivers. And there's a really uh, good paper here saying that in the rivers, they study more than 100 uh, rivers. And depending on the river, from 2 to 50, close to 50% of the animals that they have came from uh, farm conditions. So yeah, it's a huge problem. Probably a huge problem at the global scale, but there's not that many people that are working. When, when you go to a congress in aquaculture, there's SKP uh, session, and most of them are on the Atlantic South. Actually, they're talking together. And this is, okay. and here, I, I select this. <laughs> okay, I'm the one to the picture that I show you. If I was no virgin, okay, I'm French, so I, I can show you. But if I was no virgin, I'm not sure I would have shown this picture. But this is the biggest problem today of the industry. I went there last year. This cost to the industry one billion of euro per year. So they're going to put a lot of money to solve those two problems. This problem is almost resolved, but this one is not resolved at all. So it's the biggest problem. So what are they going to do? Aquaculture is a very dynamic industry. What we do know 10 years ago, honestly, is no longer true today. It depends on where you are in the country. But if you're living in a country that really uh, trusts on aquaculture, you're going to put money on it. And I went there, and do you see these small cages? These small cages were, and actually I discussed with the guy who buy that, 60 million euro, the cages. With that, they're going to move offshore. Why they do that? They do that because the Norwegian uh, uh, minister have given license, and they don't want to give other license. That's why also Norwegians are uh, investing all around the world. Because they have a lot of money, but they cannot invest any longer in their country. So they're moving offshore. So there's a lot of people saying, oh, yes, there's huge potential for producing uh, offshore. Of course, do you have 70 million to buy these small cages? I don't think so. There's not that many countries that can afford for that. And this only, uh, there's no public. Uh, subvention, uh, subsidies, sorry, in this. I asked the question and the guy looked at me and said, no. And I said, I, that was a silly question, actually. But I said, are you sure they're not going to be destroyed? He said, we have the petroleum, you know, uh, industry. So they're making, lot, they're used to make those things. 
And actually, it was built in, in China. Anyway, and they're going to produce 7,000 tons in this cage. And what they are doing that, that's because they move offshore, they will, know, they will have no escapees, and their main goal is to have no uh, parasites. I told you it costs a lot of money. There are other projects, yeah, honestly, they really believe in aquaculture. So when they show their projects, it's like crazy. And there's the one I like the most. I saw the guy who invented that. He said six years ago, he said, I want to invite, uh, invent um, a laser that will kill the parasite without killing the fish in the tanks. So he went to Congress saying that. People were laughing, of course. But last year, they, are, uh, they have done that. <laughs> So, in the cages, you have lasers and kill millions of parasites per day. And no injury in the fish. It's crazy. Okay, if you don't like that, you don't like the Star Wars uh, solution, you might <laughs> like uh, this one. This one is much, uh, I would call, natural. We're not farming some species to eat the parasites. Okay, we put them in the cages. So, you have lab soccer that I'm not sure we have the same here, but actually in Canada we have exactly the same on you know, the East Coast or different kind of races. So depending on the solution, and all those things exist. And the industry is, you know, investing in all those. And this guy will send this very expensive, so perhaps it will be very rich. <laughs> so are we seeing a truth? That's another question I ask. Do we observe a true diversification of the production? This is very simple to do. Anybody can do it. You go on the AFL database and you will put the number of farm species per, per year. So you see a global trend. Yeah. So the message, and there are some very good articles, when the high impact factors like science or nature saying that, yeah, we're domesticating easily fish. Look. Okay. But there might be another way to see it. Is that for one year, and I'm doing that for all the years, but I will show you just for one year, 2009. Very simple. You take the volume of, <coughs> of production per, per species. And actually what you do see is that for most of them, the production is so small. It's either failed or it's very small. And 20 species represent more than 90 percent of the global volume of aquaculture. So it reminds me what I said on land. We are currently focusing on very few species. On very few species. And we are introducing them all around the world, such as common carp and bush crop and so on. So the number is just the number of species or oh, number of countries where it is. And there was also a good talk uh, that was made earlier this year on this project, and this is one of the biggest uh, problems in the U.S., the introduction of some part. Are we already seeing what we are doing in land? I mean, standardization of patterns. Sushi. 20 years ago, sushi was nothing. If you go to Paris, it's impossible to eat sushi. Now, if you go to Paris, the easiest thing to eat is sushi. Same thing all around France and probably all around the world. So yeah, we do eat less and less. So of course, I will not say that aquaculture is wonderful. No, aquaculture was nothing. When it increased, of course, it will take this, the place of something else. So modification, destruction, and the work that have been done is, of course, the mangrove. So clearly, we have to restore some ecosystem and say no to aquaculture development in certain areas of the world. What's the point of destroying an entire ecosystem? Coral reef, for example, just for the spawn species. I want you to better eat chicken. <laughs> so one of the biggest problems was also 20 or 30 years ago. Everybody thought that because we have to feed, and especially the Atlantic and salmon, the carnivores, that aquaculture will not develop too much. So either we should stop that, and I understand the thinking behind that, so better farm models or large traffic level species. Yeah, of course, you don't have to feed them. 
or, and this is exactly what's happening. We still, Norwegian will never stop the accounting itself. It's so huge. It's the biggest industry just after oil and mining in this industry, in, the, in this country. So what they do is going to say, okay, it's not possible to give them other fish. So we're going to give them other things. So they're using bycatch, land by products, and now vegetables. So today, for them, the problem is parasites, no longer uh, uh, forage fish. In 1990, 83% of the of the meals came from fish, so fish meal and fish oil. And in 2017, it's 22, and they can go almost close to zero. But it depends on huge market all around the world. The price of the soil to, uh, of soil compared to uh, the price of, of fish meal. So yeah. So in a few years, we are living in a very changing, uh, changing world. This is basically what pushed me uh, a few years ago to uh, try to put all what I show you today. Plus it's in French, so nobody will look at him, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but the point is that we are living in a changing world. And so this is an article that I've just been published. And look at the, uh, the title in the newspaper. And you can see from developing or developed countries, we don't have the same perception of our culture. In some countries, they push a lot. In Vietnam, they, they base their, their development of aquaculture of Bangkok. So they put a lot of money, and they want to increase because they have nothing else. And in other countries, we have something else. We have marinas, we have tourists, we have so, so many things. So uh, it's not developing. So to finish, we know that we have to feed more people in the coming years. We all know that. The question is, what are we going to give to those people? And there's two extremes, I would say. Either we feed like this, so probably we don't need more food. We just have to eat less, or in different ways. Or if we want more people to eat more like that, of course, we're in big trouble. So you see, it's not, not only the number of human that we have. It's also the lifestyle that we do have. And to conclude, I love this picture. I read it in the print while coming. Because I think now that we are living in a, in a very tiny planet. And for the first time ever, agriculture, fisheries, aquaculture are more, more linked than ever. So if you want to develop something, you have to think of the consequences in the other parts of uh, the world, and it's really not simple. If you look at Atlantic salmon, because everybody knows that, actually, they are using Brazilian soya to feed them. It's crazy, but that's the way it's going. And I would like just to finish with this beautiful picture of the most beautiful area in the world. Of course, you will recognize some here, you know? Uh, I was there two months ago, because I'm lucky enough to have a contract with, uh, with St. Pierre to develop agriculture, uh, fisheries, and aquaculture. So it's a small, uh, so we have small volumes. So it was the sunrise. And thank you very much for your attention.